Financial Beat Quality Audit from 2005. But the twist on that is combining it with the Beat Quality Assurance information to tell you how those things kind of intertwine and tangle together. And so several of you are probably familiar with National Beat Quality Audits, and so it'll be a refresher. For some of you, maybe you haven't heard of the most recent data, which that was actually three years old. Um, but it'll hopefully give us a perspective on why some of the things we talk about relative to um, defects and those kinds of things is important. And then following this, Brad Morgan and one of the graduate students, who I'm not exactly sure who's coming out to help him tonight, uh, one of the graduate students will give you a quality defect quiz. So if you could see the actual defects on a table, could you identify them as that defect? And what do you think the value associated with those defects is? Because we won't talk a lot about specific values of individual things in the presentation. But yet, you can look at what a packer discount might be for those if we have them pop up in the industry. So as we get started, this is the, how many of you are familiar with the natural beef quality audit? Just see me, I shook my hands. <coughs> a handful of you. The 2005 audit was the fourth of such audit that was done. The first one was done in 1991, followed by one in 95, 2000, and 2005. I was fortunate enough to be at Colorado State when we did the 2000 audit, and so I was one of the graduate students that got to run the road doing that. And in 2005, I was here, had just gotten here when we started that project, so got to be involved with that as well. So I've been involved in the last two. And the goal of that is really to look at those defects that are production related, whether it's management or genetics. What can we tell producers about the defects? What incidents do they occur at? What value we associate with those? And what are packers doing with that product? Now the focus is on end products from production. So there's some things we know that we can control in production. There's some things we know we can't. But yet it's looking at all those in product defects. And it's really used, to give you a background and kind of the importance of it, it's really used as a background information on for a lot of people to quote a lot of different statistics and things that might be occurring in the industry. Because if you do a Google search, as all of our students today like to say, well, if we don't know, we'll just go Google it, because everything that shows up on the internet is true, right? If you Google search the National Beef Quality Audit, you will get over 500,000 web pages that either cite that information or that have the final report on it based on the most recent information that's out there. From these, we put together executive summaries. The summary from the 2005 audit should be in your book somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where it's at, but it should be located in there. And it's going to look something like that. The theme that we had in 2005 was called Staying on Track. If it's not in there, I can give you copies of it, because I know we do have some. Hopefully it's in there. You're all searching, so maybe it didn't get in there. Travis, you seen it? Is it in the back pocket, maybe? Perhaps? In the back tab? <laughs> We're looking. Here we go. Survey. Maybe they didn't get here in time. <coughs> I'll see if I can find it and I'll, and I'll get it for you. I don't know if I have enough copies, but we can always get them sent out to you as well. No, the tentative the survey is in there, but you may, we'll get you the executive summary. <laughs> the reason we call it staying on track is as you realize, and I'm going to present some of the data I'm going to present to you, is it's just a snapshot of the information we collect. But I'll try to share with you kind of what we've seen from 91 through 2005. But what you see is there's not a lot of change from 2000 to 2005, and so how can we keep on the same track we're on with improvement and yet even go further? But the basis and the reason these audits have been done in the past is from the Beach Quality Assurance Program. And that, if you think about the Beef Quality Assurance Program, you've all probably heard about it, you've all probably been involved in programs related to Beef Quality Assurance. That program is a national program run through NCBA, but then each state kind of incorporates their own individualized state program for producer education. And so while there's a set of national guidelines, it's also state, a state focus. And so the Beef Quality Assurance Program asks that these audits be done so we can track information and track these statistics. And so it's done in three phases. First of all, a survey of the industry. Everything from producers, cow-calf, 
and the seed stock producers all the way through the end users, meaning restaurateurs, retailers, and purveyors, or people that are cutting steaks for restaurants. A period of implant data collection, so putting a team of people on the kill floor as well as in the cooler to track carcasses and, and capture data. And then the last phase is establishment of goals for the next audit, which hopefully is in five years, so in that case, 2010. And so the implant data collection period for 2005 was in two periods of time. Because they were concerned, because there was a transition there with what are we going to do with funding? Is there a chance that funding is going to increase? Is there a chance we have? There were a lot of issues going on when they funded the project. The initial data collection period was limited to June through September of 2005. Now the previous audits had run from April to November. And so if you think about that time frame versus limiting it June through September, that really tightened our window of cattle production. And so it's a different kind of cattle that we were seeing in that tight window compared to, comparing, compared to previous years of using that entire big range of the year. And so they had us go back and do each plant again between March and June of 2006 so that we had a better window of comparison to really do accurate comparisons for all four audits. So what kind of data we, do we capture? On the kill floor, we're looking at things like mud. How much mud and manure are on the carcasses, or on the cap, on the hive? How much contamination are they coming in with? What's our chance of, and the reason for that is, what's the chance of cross-contamination to the carcass? Looking at cross-contamination of fecal matter, as well as potentially microorganisms that could cause us, cause us a problem. Horns, not only did they have horns, but how big are the horns? Doing that from the standpoint of, is there a link between horns and bruise rates in lots? Hide color. If we all think about how the industry has changed from 91 to 95 to 2000 to 2005, what's one of the biggest things that's changed in the industry? They're all black. Eyes. They're all black. And so, well, we knew what the answer was going to be. The question becomes, can we start documenting what percentage are black, so what percent could qualify for different programs that are out there, and do we need to start looking at some other things. Brands that are looking at location, so are they on the shoulder, are they on the rib, are they on the hip, but size, so is it just a nice little small brand, or is it a 6x6 six six brand, or is it a 10x12 brand, and then how many? Do they just have one? Or is it one of those creatures that, for some reason, now has a name, address, and phone number branded on it in a way that can we reduce the amount of high defects to recapture some value from that? And identification was the last thing in that area. Identification meaning, are they lot identified, individually identified, and how? So trying to look at, with a push towards individual identification and traceability, where are we at from an industry standpoint? Do we have anything? started? Is there anything going? Or do we have something to build on? Or are we starting from scratch? Also looking at bruises. Bruise size or severity. Is it one of those that's very superficial? Can we just cut off some fat tissue and get rid of it? Or does it go deep into that muscle? Is it going to devalue one of our primals? So not only size, but location. Because a bruise that cuts into the round is going to have a different value than a bruise that cuts into the rib or the loin. Condemnations of livers, lungs, heads, tongues, whole carcasses, etc. Looking at are there animal health issues that need to be addressed from the standpoint of health prevent prevention or detection and treatment of livestock and dentition. That's the first this is the first time we've looked at dentition during the audit, looking at based on USDA's protocol of looking at dentition for 30 months. How does that relate, how does our dentition information relate to our cooler information on actual skeletal maturity and looking at how many carcasses are going to meet these requirements different countries are putting in place for export. Then the cooler, looking at all the quality grades and yield grade factors. So marbling, maturity for quality grade, hot carcass weight, rib by area, fat thickness and percent kidney, pelvic and heart fat or internal fat for yield grades. Apparent breed type. Are they native, false syndicates, dairy type? 
packers or if you look at grid prices, there's a discount for dairy type cattle because of the shape of those muscles. And so it's not as easy to market those products. And so there's a discount there. So where's our breed type falling? Gender, fat color, blood splash, callus, different types of defects related to production. And quantifying how many were identified as being over 30 months of age. Now this classification comes from the dentition that USDA would have been doing on the kill form. Identifying those, some of them are with a blue streak, some of them are with a blue ribbon tied on the front shank, various ways that those are identified in different plants. So if we look at just some information from phase one. Phase one being the interviews or questionnaires that we sent to producers. And so if we look at Produce all producers together, if we ask them what our biggest quality challenges are, or what the biggest concerns we should have as the industry are, greatest quality challenges since 1991, so as they identify those in 2005, but being clarified as since the first audit, biggest challenges are insufficient marbling, lack of uniformity. Here's the challenge with that one. Define uniformity. You're shaking your head, so what's the uniformity? Could be weight. Could be weight. Could be yield rate. Could, could be quality. Could be, could be, quality. Could be quality. Could be yield. Could that's, be height color. That's one thing. That's that's deviation. Deviation. Standard deviation. And so as you try to get producers or anyone in the industry to define uniformity, it doesn't work. Because it becomes lack of uniformity or lack of consistency in whatever they believe the trait that's most important is. For some people, it's weight. For some people, it's ribeye. For some people, it's fat. For some people, it's marbling. And so getting people to actually define that where we can further or better qualify that statement is very difficult. Inadequate tenderness, too high of a yield grade, tied for fifth, low cutability, and too heavy of carcasses. And you can see the list goes on to injection sites, flavor, muscling, and fat. <laughs> we also ask producers, what do you believe the impact of the previous audits, so 91, 95, and 2000, what impact have those audits had on changes you have made in your production system? Whether that's injection site placement, or brand location, or size, or anything like that, 26, almost 27% said a strong impact, 55% said a moderate impact. So again, that's a fairly open-ended question, but it gives you an idea of what <coughs> how people look at the information. If you look at the same information from Packers, same questions, what are the biggest challenges, what impact have the past audits had? Number one, reduced quality grade and tenderness due to implants. Now that wasn't a specific quality challenge on the list, but enough Packers listed it as an other and specified it that it becomes number one on the list. One of those fluke deals. Number two, lack of uniformity, but they specified in live cattle. Now, but that still could mean weight, size, I mean, it still has a lot of different meanings that it can carry on. Number three, too heavy of carcasses and too high of yield grades, and type of fifth, bruises and height damage. Now, the funny thing about number three, too heavy of carcasses, they'll tell you they're too heavy, but yet, if you look at grid prices over the past 10 years, what's happened to that heavyweight discount? Where's it gone? The weight limit for quote unquote a heavyweight has gone up. 10 years ago, what was the line for a heavyweight? Well, what is about 30 weight? On a carcass basis. 850. Where is it today? Depends on the plant. You might see a small, you might see a really small discount from 950 to 1,000, and then your big discount is 1,000. And so they haven't helped that at all. Where they say, well, carcasses keep getting bigger, where you're still paying them to produce a big carcass. Because if you look at the data, you're, the biggest value, the biggest impact on their price is still weight. And so unless you change that mentality, you're never going to change that that's going to inc that that continues to increase. Did you ask these questions in the past, or is this the first time you've asked them? This has been asked in the past, yes. How are they, 
correspond to the last two? If you look at, I think I might have that slide in here. So if you give me a minute, I might get there. If I don't so get have, there they, have they changed their minds? It's still the same thing. They've the changed same. their mind on some things, but they haven't changed their mind on others. If that makes sense, without giving it away. What about end users? End users, if you look at their top, slide says top ten, it really summarizes it better in the top five. Lack of uniformity and consistency. Now these guys get even more specific. Marbling and tenderness. Not consistent enough for marbling and tenderness. Cuts are too large for food service and restaurant trade. Excess fat, abscesses or lesions and cuts, trimmings and variety meats, and blood splash muscle. So I'm going to talk about a couple of these. If you look at number two, cuts too large for food service and restaurant trade. If you go to a restaurant, how is every steak sold? By the ounce. By the ounce. If you go to retail, how is every, how's every steak sold? By the pound. So if you're a consumer in a retail setting, what are you really looking at when you go to pick out a steak? If you're a typical consumer, you're looking at the cost of the entire package. And so they're trying to keep those packages within a certain cost range. So if you have a 9 square inch, or we'll be more realistic, if you have an 11 or 12 square inch ribeye versus a 19 square inch ribeye, what happens to the thickness of those steaks to keep that package cost the same? It shrinks. They get thinner. But what do consumers like to see? That nice, thick, inch, inch and a quarter steak. So what happens in the restaurant? Same thing, right? They don't change their menu. Their menu's not an inch steak. It's tomorrow, I think we're having 12 ounces ribeyes when we go out to dinner tomorrow night. Well, some of your ribeyes may be thin, some of your ribeyes may be thick. It all depends on what showed up in the box that day. Right? That's how they market it. So when they talk about variability and being too large, it's too large because they can't make that good looking steak for a consumer. And so some will get too thin. If you look at number five, blood splash muscle, as we started to probe a little bit, what we really came to learn is that blood splash muscle really meant bruised muscle tissue. It just looked to them like there was blood in it. And so they call it blood splash, but it was really bruised. It's not a typical blood splash like we think of in the industry. We also asked end users what has improved the best since 1999, or where have we made the greatest improvements in the beef industry? And their responses are improved microbiological safety, Improved genetics, which as you probe a little bit there, they're saying there's more Angus. Is there really more Angus or are there just more Angus programs, which means there's more black kind of cattle. And beef of higher quality grades. Now there's groups that will argue that say quality grades have not improved over time. The audit's going to tell you that quality grades have improved over time. And number three, fewer injection side agents. So we've made some progress in those areas. What about our beef checkoff dollars? Don't you think improve the end users feeling about beef with some of those dollars? I think that might have something to do with it. I mean, we're doing a better job of education now than we did in 1991, right? Of educating on cooking or safe handling. safe handling and all those issues that play into those. So it could be a lot of things that attribute that, attribute to that. Now, you can't just say it's all because we've done the National Beef Quality Audit, but there are improvements that we've seen in the industry, but who gets the benefit of that or who's the most responsible for that, it's, it's hard to get at that answer. What was the increase or uh, percentage in, in, in quality grades that they did see in the audit? Uh, we'll get to that. Phase two, right? Phase two is the implant audits. One of the things that you see from that came up commonly. Go ahead. Has there been any questions asked about their perception of our industry from 91 to today? In other words, have, have we done a better job of educating? Have we done a better job of being stewards for our industry? And those we did not ask questions of that nature. So we haven't asked any education or perception type questions of the groups. It's also been based on quality defects specific to the audit. So we take one of those things that came up in those interviews, 
you saw producers still say there was an injection site lesion issue, but you said you saw end users say that it's one of the greatest things, or the, one of the greatest improvements that's been seen since the first audit. Well, if you look at all the base quality assurance information that's out there, it all says we need to get top butt injection site lesions out of there, get injections out of the top butt, get them out of the round, get them in front of the point of the shoulder. Because we know it decreases quality because it causes those lesions. The last thing you want on your dinner plate is for something like this to show up in your roast or your steak when you cut into it. And that's actually from one of the beef quality assurance coordinators in the country who cut into a roast on a Sunday afternoon and he tells the story that his wife was really perturbed when he gave up dinner to go get the camera and take all these pictures of this lesion instead of sitting down with the family to have dinner. But he was way too excited about finding a lesion that he could use as a real life example that he himself encountered. So we know that decreases quality. We know it decreases tenderness. We know it's visually very unappetizing. Injection sites will show up in a variety of forms. This lesion here that's in these two states is that very black or what is actually called a metallic lesion. Metallic lesions are either school bus yellow in color or black in nature from a chemical that's in the product and how it's metabolized in the animal system once that injection is given. And you can see it doesn't just impact one state. In some cases, you'll lose that entire product. If you look at this picture of this top butt, how many of you are going to eat any of that? This one's easy to cut off, right? You can see it in the picture. You can cut that off. It'll look visually. It'll look fine. But what happens if we have a fluid-filled lesion? Well, if you're in a plant that's cutting steaks and you hit a fluid-filled lesion, USDA will shut you down. You get to do complete cleanup. Everything that's on the table gets discarded. It doesn't matter if it's touched this fluid or not. You do complete sanita sanitation of everything, just like, just like you were ending a shift and starting a new one. Then you get to run again. Now, fluid filled lesions have actually decreased to pretty much nothing, but yet it's still something that happens commonly in cow bulls. And so we still have that issue in cow rounds and bull rounds. And so all the information you've seen, and you've probably all shared the information with producers, or producers have probably all utilized it, put them in the neck. I am or sub Q, it doesn't matter. Get them in the neck where we have the least valuable cut possible. How many of you have bought a neck roast lately? That's what I thought. There's not many products that are out there. Now, if we have a preference, we prefer to go sub Q over I am. So if you do get too far back in that chuck area, <coughs> that it's under the skin, that it would come off with the hide, that there's no devalue happening in the muscle tissue. Because if we get those too far back, and some of it happens with shoot design, some of it happens with speed, we can get these lovely green colored lesions. And this is a problem that I hadn't heard a lot about until this week again. Last week, I guess today's Monday. I'm kind of screwed up. These are actually chuck steaks, chuck roasts, in modified atmosphere or high oxygen packaging. And those steaks look very normal when they went in there. No discoloration, no black, no green, bright cherry red product. But once you put them in that modified atmosphere package for 24, 48 hours, that green color developed. And this actually was part of my dissertation research when I was at CSU. Figuring out what was that and can we identify what's causing it? Well, we can't identify it specifically but we know it's an injection site lesion from doing histopath work on it and plating or putting those products on slides to look at the tissue damage inside there. They are injection site lesions. We actually caused those purposely to see if we could figure out what was causing it. And it's either sulfur or copper in part of the product that's going to cause that problem. Now, I hadn't heard a lot from, we did this research based on what we were hearing from packers who were selling product to a specific company who has a large market share in the retail world, who you can probably all guess who it is, 
who said we're having way too many problems. Because high oxygen package, modified atmosphere, case ready, already has a label on it when it goes to the store. And so some of those would not have even be, been seen by the retailer, but typically sometimes they weren't seen until the consumer opened up that package at home. Where are you seeing that most of popping up? To find where, you mean like retail-wise? What, what, what kind of cartridge? In Chuck products. So it's actually, it's happening just at the point of that shoulder where we're still cutting Chuck steaks or Chuck roast out of. And so those injections are getting just slightly behind the point of that scapula where it's not coming off the neck portion, it's actually staying in the Chuck cut. You're saying it's plant or regional differences? No. Not from what we hear from the Packers. What's the frequency of the Well, I have a phone call in. Last week I got a phone call from one of the Packers that said, you know, we hadn't heard that this was a big issue in the last year, but now it's popping up again at a pretty good rate. And that was a voicemail that I had from Friday. That, and I wasn't in Friday afternoon, and so that's just the voicemail I have. And I haven't been able to reconnect with them to find out, well, okay, increased incidence, what's that mean? There's a couple of injectable trace mineral products on the market that contain copper, zinc, sulfur, and manganese. When? Not sulfur, copper, zinc, manganese, and now, the, selenium. I don't, I don't know a lot about the vet world, and so others in here may know more. The vets that worked on, that helped with the histo work that was done in the vet school at CSU, <coughs> said they believe it's in the carrier of that product, or in the adjuvant of that product. There's been a couple of new ones of those over the last three or four years. So, and this research would have been done in, in, let's see, I finished in 2002, so it would have been done early 2002, late 2001 is when we were looking at these products. Just a random group of products with different types of carriers knowing that those potential types might have an impact. Because adjuvants, as most of you probably know, that adjuvant or that carrier doesn't completely go away. It's not harmful in any way, but it doesn't completely disappear from that animal system. And so it's always located where that lesion is. So can't completely explain it, but we know it's an issue which pushes us back to make sure they get in front of the point of the shoulder and that neck portion in that triangle where it's going to be cut off. So that's why you see preferred injections at that location in the neck. This is just one of various pictures that you see out there to promote that. So what do our end users tell us about future issues? Now realize this was three years ago. So this is end users, restaurants, retailers, and purveyors or state cutters telling us these are the things we need to address, one of which is bacterial populations being specifically multi-drug resistant strains of bacteria. So what are we going to do to combat salmonella that are resistant to five different antibiotics? In case a human does come down with salmonellaosis, what happens if it's multi-drug resistant? What are we getting, do we need to change anything in production to deal with that? Additional BSC issues, market access and export requirements, meaning age and source verification. 2005, they say it's a must. So how do we deal with that? What do we do? They say price of beef is so high that they can't compete, meaning it's hard for them to add a lot of new beef items to the menu because it's a lot cheaper for them to add a chicken item to the menu than it is beef. If you go look at restaurant menus and analyze what percent of your products on that menu are beef versus pork versus chicken, what's your typical thought when you go into a restaurant? How many options do you have if you want beef on the menu? Typically, you might have a couple different steaks and a burger, right? How many salads do you see with beef on them? Not very many, if any. How many chicken dishes do you see? Quite a few, because you have chicken in pasta, and you have chicken on salads, and you have chicken by itself, and so there's lots of different ways that they're incorporating chicken into the menu and not doing that so much with beef. Eating inconsistencies. So 
So being primarily tenderness juiciness and flavor related. So going back to one of their complaints of inconsistencies in marbling and tenderness from their first big quality challenge. <coughs> and they said animals keep getting bigger. They also said that was a quality challenge. Now they're telling us it's also a future issue you have to deal with. How are you going to keep weight and size appropriate? What do we do when we have these boxes made for five strip loins or five ribeyes and they keep getting bigger? Are we going to need bigger people to carry them? Or are we going to cut it down and only put four of those in a box to make it logistically capable of carrying those products? Or if you look at it from another perspective, weight issues, a lot of those products, strips and revised in particular, top butts are, are marketed lights and heavies. So are we just going to change that breakoff point where we get priced as a light or a heavy product if we're an end user? Or are we just never going to be able to get light product if weight continues to increase? So if we go back to one of the points from end users, one of their points was how are we going to meet this export market demand with all these changes for age requirements and such. So this is obviously information from 2005. It's probably changed. I haven't asked anyone at USDA if there's updated numbers on this. But in this small period of time from the middle of November, or excuse me, the middle of December towards the end of January, so you're looking at just over a month, over 4 million carcasses were presented for grading. Of those 4 million, 312,000 qualified to be exported to Japan. And so, not even 7%. 250,000, just over, were approved by A40 certification, meaning by skeletal maturity. So that's 5%. So that's a vast majority of that total 7%. The other 57,000 were approved by age verification. I mean, they had documentation on hand to tell what the age was of those animals. So obviously there's still work to do relative to meet that goal. The other thing we get into with export markets is their definition of quality is often different from our definition of quality. Because they perceive certain words to be value to them. So if you look at their top five terms for what they determine to be quality, it's U.S. Prime, U.S. Choice, Certified English, Certified English Beef, U.S. Beef in general is quality, as well as corn fed. Whereas you think of our gold standard, what we think is the highest quality, we say prime. Which is true based on our grading standard, but that's not all, always just what quality means when we talk about export markets. So what's important to those who export? Or those who are trading beef to export markets, their top five concerns are unknown age and source, size and weight, marbling, color is important because it's still got to have that bright cherry red color when it gets over there, and administration of growth promoting implants. Because that either makes them eligible or not eligible for EU. Their other concerns are feeding vitamin E. Those who trade said it should be mandatory because it gives us that nice antioxidant capability, keeps it that bright cherry red color longer. Animal welfare, they said it was an issue in 2005. Has it been an issue lately? Oh yeah, I mean we can watch the video if you want, but you've all probably seen it already. Tenderness should be genetically assured. They say beef is excessively fat and should be injection site free. So a lot of the things we've talked about in the audit. Now what if you ask government agencies? This was kind of the last group relative to the face-to-face -face interviews or questionnaires. Was what do the government agencies say are the challenges? Lack of mandatory traceability ID system and national animal ID compliance. <coughs> Inconsistent product, food safety, BSE. Growing concern for humane handling and animal welfare environment. Inadequate tenderness. Appropriate SRM removal. Growing concern about residues. Carcass and cut weights too heavy. And then kind of this overall big tie for 10 was shelf life. Lack of source and age verification cattle. 
um, antimicrobial resistance, and a whole list of other things. So lots of things you've already heard about. So now on to phase two. Looking at horns, bruises, severity and location. And if we look at this data, and this slide has a lot of data on it, it's got in the first bar percent with no hot iron side brand or no hot iron brands, the yellow bar no side brands, the next bar no horns, and the last blue bar no bruises. So if you look at over the, all the years, we have the best numbers ever in 2005 compared to the previous three audits. 62% didn't have a hot iron brand. 93% had no side brands, 78% didn't have horns, and 65% were free of bruises. So that's improvement all the way across. What pro why do we worry about these things? Bruises have to be trimmed. The government's going to mandate that. And so if you have bruises like this in that picture, you end up with what we call windows in those carcasses, or bruise product that has been trimmed out of that carcass so it's no longer present. That's obviously going to play an impact on the value of that carcass from a weight perspective, plus if it goes into one of those major cuts, specifically the loin or the rib, you're going to have a huge loss in value product. And so we keep looking for significant causes of that and figuring out how we can address that. What else causes trim besides bruises? Bird shot, buck shot, steel shot, lead shot, whatever you want to call it, whether it's mischief, I don't know how long it takes you to drive around where you're from to find a stop sign like that. I'm guessing it doesn't take long around Stillwater. <laughs> Bird hunters, or hunters in general, getting mad that they haven't seen anything or mistaking animals, production animals for whatever they're hunting. When I first moved to Minnesota, and Steve might remember this, when I first moved to Minnesota, there was a big story on that a girl's, she was on horseback and she, her horse got shot because the hunter thought it was a deer. I don't know if you remember that in the news or not. How you mistake a horse for a deer, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> it's a big one without antlers. <laughs> Whether it's that producer, I'm sure none of you guys have ever done this or heard of this. That producer's neighbor's bull got in with his cows again and he just happens to have a shotgun in his pickup. We'll just pop him, he'll never come back. Right? I guarantee that happens here. <laughs> or, or whether it's just gathering or mustering cattle with shotguns from helicopter. Now that was a big thing. This article comes out of the actually the Australian newspaper. When we first identified this issue in the 99 cow audit, that's when Australia was starting their get the lead out program because they were having a huge issue with bird shot in their product. And so, although it's hard for us to track just being on the kill floor, what percent we identify, we know it's an issue. We see a few of them with bird shot um, in the cow audit. We see a few of them with bird shot in the fed audit. But we know what happens in U.S. product. <laughs> we also look at defects, defects, condemnations. And so whether it's tongues, livers, tripe, and we try to get from the packers why, or from the inspectors why that product has been condemned. I didn't want to present all the data to you, but this is just livers and tongues because it's the most dramatic in terms of change over the four years, or the four audits. What, what were those tongues condemned for? How Tongues, it's a combination of cactus tongue or just what they'll label as contamination. And so that's the two main reasons that you'll see tongues condemned. Livers, obviously the biggest reason is abscesses and flukes. You'll get a little bit of contamination in there, but not a whole lot. Liver condemnations in 2000 were a huge concern to the Packers, being at 30%. Obviously that has come down in that five years to two, to 25 percent. So in five years it did decrease. Where it's at today I can't exactly tell you, but it is a concern of the Packers because it is worth some money to them. It's worth more money now with the 
export markets back open than it was when they were closed. In the cooler, obviously we're spending a lot of time looking at quality grade, yield grade data. So <coughs> marbling, maturity, and you'll learn more about this tomorrow. But if we look at quality grades, 91 to 2005, your yellow bars are percent prime and choice. The blue bars, standard and lower, so the, the missing percentage is your selects. 2005, 57% prime and choice, 5% standard and lower. So we best numbers ever. This was also, I mean, we also hear, have heard a lot of information from different groups saying, we're decreasing quality grade, and they blame it on a number of things, including distillers, that we've heard people say. But based on the audit data, in 2005, we had the best results ever relative to quality grade. Are we, are we producing our ideal consist? Let me first of all def define ideal consist. If you take a survey of end users, restaurant, retail, and purveyors, and say, what percent, if you could buy the ideal percentage for your market, what percent prime, top choice, so upper two-thirds choice, low choice, select, and standard, and lower, would you buy? Those numbers are averaged over all those end users. You can see they would like to have ideals in this peach kind of color. 7% prime, almost 30% top choice, 33% low choice, and about 31% select is what they would like. With no standards, you can see that we're slightly off from that. Are we ever going to produce the amount of primes that they want? No. It's not going to happen. We're never going to get above that 2-3% range, 4% probably at the highest that we'll ever get. We're at almost 20% top choice, but again, they almost want 30, and so we're still not there. We do give them enough low choice. We're right about even there, but we're high on selects and we're high on standards. So we don't quite meet their ideal. We also spend time looking at yield grade traits. Ribeye area, fat thickness, weight, and internal fat. This is a steer versus heifer comparison for 05. Steer's carcass weight, 817. Heifers were at 758. Fat thickness, steer's at a half inch. Heifers, 57 hundredths. KPH, 2.1 versus 2.5%. Not a lot of difference there. Each of them had a 13.4 average for ribeye area. Knowing what you know about yield grades and the four traits go into it, which one's going to have the highest yield grade? Steers or vectors? We'll test your knowledge before we Highest numerically, so the worst. Which one's going to have the highest numerical or the worst yield grade? Who thinks heifers? Who thinks steers? How many of you are going to vote? <laughs> you like my grad class. Close. They're pretty close. Because of that difference, the only difference you really have is fat. You have a difference in fat, slight difference in fat, but you have more muscle per 100 pounds of carcass weight in your heifers than you do in steers. All right, so carcass weight. Talked about carcass weight already. If you look at 91 to 2005, we started at 759, went down to 748. By 2005, we're back up to 796 for an average hot carcass weight. That is over 800 pounds today. That number is. I think the last number I saw for an average carcass weight was 817. Where that's going to end up in 2008, I don't know. So what about yield grades? Now I showed you steers versus heifers for 2005. This is, in the yellow bar, yield grade 1 and 2. The blue bar yield grade 4s and 5s for each one of the audits. 53% yield grade 1s and 2s, 14% yield grade 4s and 5s in 2005. You've seen that increase from 95 to 2000 to 2005, that increase in yield grade 4s and 5s. You've seen weight increase. So the question is, is ribeye area increasing at the same rate weight, carcass weight is, to keep that yield grade at a constant level, or is that why we see an increase of four and fives? Or are we just feeding them to be fatter? 
There's lots of things that can go into changing that yield grade distribution. So it's probably a combination of all that. We do the same thing for ideal yield grade. Now, obviously, we're going to ask a different target group this question because to a retailer, to a purveyor, what's their does this quite, would this question make any sense? No. No, because they're getting everything in a quarter inch or an eighth inch trim. That's how it's coming from the packer. So the group that we ask this question to is the packer saying, what's your ideal concept? Because you know that you're going to get everything from ones to fives or that that's going to happen in the industry. What's your ideal mix? What are you willing to accept? About 14% yield grade ones. They would like 53% yield grade twos. About 32% yield grade threes. They're willing to take a few, very few, yield grade fours because they realize some cattle will grade if you feed them to a yield grade four. Others will not. They just keep putting on more fat. They don't want any yield grade fives because they know they have to trim everything to a quarter inch or less. That's the only way they're going to sell it. So if you look at that relative to our distribution, we have some work to do there as well. <coughs> Part of what we try to do in that end discussion, trying to figure out what story you tell producers, is what value are we losing in industry due to these defects? So we put a value on quality grade and yield grade based on how the packers tell us to price that. Weight, whether they're too light, because there are discounts, believe it or not, for carcasses under 550 pounds. You don't see them very often, but it's a fairly large discount. I think last week's discount for SWIFT was $40 a weight for lightweight carcasses. So there's a discount there, but there's also a discount for heavyweights. We see a lot more of those than we do lightweights. And then high defects and off all condemnations. So the total value loss is almost $56 due to those four things. Now what contributes to that lost opportunity? Where are we losing products at? Where do we lose carcasses at in terms of falling into a defect category? 14% yield grade fours and fives. Five and a half percent were outside of that target carcass weight of 550 to 950. 5% standard and lower. Almost 2% dark cutters. 1.5% C to E maturity. 0.8% were classified as greater than 30 months that were technically A maturity. 0.6% blood splash. 3%, 0.3% yellow fat. And 0.1% cattle. So if you combine all that information, we do have a top 10 quality challenge for 2005. And those top 10 are lack of traceability, individual animal ID, source and age verification, chronological age. Number two, low uniformity of cattle carcasses and cuts. We could try to find that, but we had that discussion earlier. Number three, a need to implement instrument grading, inappropriate market signals. That primarily goes back to the weight issue and what packers tell us versus how we're paid. Segmentation within the sectors. That goes back to your statement about how much information can you get back from packers. Really is where that really pointed to in the, in the discussion. Too heavy purposes and cuts, too high yield grades, inappropriate ribeye size, reduced quality grade and tenderness due to implants and insufficient harmony for the top. So the question was, well, how have people changed their mind? And all this information goes into, it doesn't go specifically back to packers or end users but it's all segments together. If you look at the top 10 quality challenges, those top 10 quality challenges that pop up in every one of the audits that's been done is fat, tenderness, marbling, and excess carcass and cut weight. So weight's been an issue since 1991, and it's done nothing but go up. In three audits, we had height problems in uniformity. Disappearing from the last two audits, so disappearing from that top 10 in 2000 and 2005 was injection sites. So we've obviously improved that, that issue. And brand new to this audit is traceability, grading, instrument grading, market signals, and communication between sectors. So the last part of the audit is really what we call the strategy workshop or the meeting of the minds, bringing everyone from producers to end users in the same room and figuring out, so what are the goals? for the next 10 years. And one of the things that they said was, you know, we're doing something well in the industry. We've made some great improvements. We've made some good strides. We've developed kind of a story for beef. We've reduced a 157 to H7. That's what they said, no five. You might get some that 
Don't believe that's true today. We have some more easy to prepare pets. We have brands We're doing great things. But at the same time, we have to make sure we deliver consumer needs and expectations. We have more work to do to meet their needs. We have more work to do for instrument grading, for decreasing fours and fives to control weight. We have more work to do to increase marbling. We have to expand marketing opportunities, and that might take a traceability system. And we have to strengthen connection between segments. So what are the 10 goals? First goal is to hit the target. Now that target tends to be different for every packer, and it tends to be different if you're going to be a participant in a certain branded beef program or those types of things. Everyone has their own target. But it's how do you stay away from things way outside the target. Hitting the bullseye is great, but at least hit the target. And stay away from ribeye areas that are less than 10 and greater than 18. Stay away from carcasses under 550 and greater than 950. Stay away from standards and hard bones. So getting at least on the target would be good. How are we going to trace? You're not going to barcode animals like we barcode products in a grocery store. So finding a way that we can do source and age verification to meet some of these marketing expectations is going to be necessary if we're going to go forward in the industry. Excess fat. Who's going to pay for it? Are you going to remove it from the production sector, or are you going to keep charging the packer with it? Now, some of you, I didn't get to see the seven cattle live that you guys get to fab tomorrow. Dr. Croft did. Some of you may get a pile of fat like that tomorrow. Some of you may not. But it's the luck of the draw. How are we going to solve inconsistency? Is that a consistent pin of cattle? Some of, you shake your head. Some of you shake your head no, and is it inconsistent because they're not all the same color? Or is it inconsistent because we're not going to have the same type of product that comes out of each of those animals? This is an old slide, and I admit it. That is an old slide, we want tender beef. But how long have we heard consumers saying that they want tender beef, and will we ever come up with a way to either guarantee that or to get rid of the number one issue of end users saying that we have inconsistencies in tenders? Instrument grading, you saw on the list of things to improve, and we've made some progress in that since 2005. Communication between sectors, it's probably not the best slide for that. I probably need to find the slide or remake it so that the arrows go in both directions so that you have communication back and forth and not just forward, so that you have an idea, you know what dressing percentages are, you know what the data looks like, and that they get that all the way back to cabin. But the end result is to build that beef business <coughs> and to like do what the industry said in terms of tell the beef story, it goes, which goes back to the new marketing campaigns that you've all probably seen on, it's not just beef, it's what's for dinner anymore, it's the Protein, power, and power, power protein. Power protein. Seen with the, the passion. Yeah. So playing on all the emotions of consumers as well. The whole concept, whether you're talking national beef quality audits or whether you're talking beef quality assurance, goes back to total quality management. And what can we do? Maybe it takes a dollar to prevent a defect. But what does that do for the industry if we can prevent that defect versus that going all the way through the customer level and what that might cost us? So with that, I'll end with one of my favorite slides to depict the presence of total quality management. Because the guys at the Arizona Department of Transportation did their job. They painted the lines on the road, but is it a quality product? Could they have spent a dollar in time or effort to make a higher quality product? Or are you going to be satisfied with just doing what you believe is your role in the industry? Or are you going to be concerned about what the consumer thinks? 